Amen. Well, today we're thinking a little bit about social snobbery. <laughs> uh, social snobbery is the feeling that your own demographic or group is somehow better uh, or elite in some way to others, um, and then kind of doing everything you can to ignore or exclude the others. My favorite TV snob is without a doubt Hyacinth Bucket from Keeping Up Appearances. Now look, you young folk, today sit tight. This is a TV show from the 90s, which I know is a different millennium now. Uh, but um, <laughs> Hyacinth Bucket took snobbery to the next level, famously preferring the French pronunciation of her name, Hyacinth Bouquet. Um, she also tried to avoid kiwis because her friend called them a lower middle class fruit. Uh, she was constantly trying to hide her relatives from her friends, telling her husband, Richard, to uh, get them to come round after dark, providing there's no moon. Uh, Richard, she said, you know I love my family, but there's no reason I should have to acknowledge them in broad daylight. <laughs> it made a great sitcom. Uh, but actually, the truth is, in real life, social snobbery can be really damaging. Uh, the Independent released an article a while back about people coming from working class backgrounds attending top universities and how there was a common theme that whilst they were all at the same institution, they were never made to feel part of the team, facing constant questions like, how did you get in here? Uh, never invited to certain elite societies or socials. I wonder if you have ever felt excluded. Have you ever felt excluded? You see, today in our, our Bible text, we discover that the Corinthian church was dividing into demographics at church, even at the communion table, which was just reinforcing these social divisions from the world. And we might say, well, look, Ben, what, like, what's the big deal? So the old folk don't sit with the young folk. Uh, the rich people don't grab lunch with the poor people. The Europeans, the Africans, the Asians sort of group together a bit. The cool people don't hang out with the accountants. That's just human behavior. I'm joking. I'm joking. You accountants, you're cool. Numbers are cool. We, <laughs> uh, that's just human behavior, isn't it, for people to sort of split into groups of people that are like them. What's the big deal? Well, Paul is deeply passionate to correct this because it communicates a false gospel. The gospel is a message of radical inclusion that Jesus welcomes everyone. Everyone means everyone. He tears down the dividing walls of hostility that we see out there in the world, that those who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Jesus, that in Jesus there is no Jew or Gentile, there is no slave or free, there is no male or female, we are all one in Christ. And that is meant to be most beautifully seen at the communion table. The communion table is designed to be this mind-boggling, stunning, stop-in-your-tracks, powerful display of radical inclusion and unity uh, that can only be explained by Jesus. Look, I'm very passionate about this. You should be too, because we don't just want to communicate the gospel here with the words we speak, but the lives we live, and we want to point people to Jesus. So let's check our text, 1 Corinthians 11. Let's get into that. The big idea today, the title of the talk is Jesus Welcomes everyone. Amen. Jesus welcomes everyone. Paul is writing to a new church in Greece, tackling a ton of different issues. Today we get to the communion table, chapter 11, verse 17. Have a look there. In the following directives, Paul says, I have no praise for you. 
for your meetings do more harm than good. It's a pretty bad report. There's no dodging the strong language there. Paul says, on this issue, I have nothing to praise about you. Your meetings are doing more harm than good. It would actually be spiritually better if you did nothing. So let me underline this teaching one more time. Embracing what God has to say to us today from his word really matters. Because if we don't get this, actually we might as well keep the doors shut. Our church will do more damage to the gospel than good. What's actually going on? Have a look at verse 18. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. Uh, So then, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. For when you're eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in, or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. Now that we need to, to get this, we need to picture the early church. When the early church got together to celebrate communion, we know from books and from fresco artwork and other things that for the first 150 years of the church, That was a full meal around somebody's house on a Sunday evening and other days of the week. They didn't have church buildings like us. They were small gatherings. It wasn't until the late second century and the third century that church buildings started appearing in this simpler form of a bit of bread and a bit of wine on a Sunday morning meeting started to appear. And so the Corinthian communion for them, this was a meal around at someone's house. And the problem was they weren't sitting down together because of social divisions among them. So picture the scene. Uh, They would gather around someone's house on a Sunday or perhaps some other day of the week after work. Probably made sense to go to the biggest house or probably the wealthiest person. In their society, the wealthy often worked fewer hours or at least they had control of their time. So imagine they finished early. Maybe they started drinking and eating at lunch. They ate all of the best food. A bit later, the next lot show up. They have whatever was left. But finally, the slaves, the shift workers, the working class laborers show up. They finish late. They arrive late, and there's nothing left for them. By that time, the first crowd have retired off to some other room of the house to drink whiskey, talk investments and holiday homes. And the others, well, they just, they just go home hungry and excluded. That is not church. That is just the world all over again repeating itself, where the world knocked certain individuals down and put walls up for certain individuals. The church was just doing it all over again. And it was heartbreaking. And look, these... These Corinthians, they were new Christians. They were brand new Christians, and they, they were dragging their social status from the world into the church. How important they thought they were in the world became how important they thought they were in the church. And Paul paints a, a really striking picture here in verse 21, where he says it's like some fat cats were off getting drunk. They had so much, whilst others were starving. It's a little bit like the outrage people have felt at the government parties whilst others were suffering. And Paul is just so upset that that kind of behavior has come into the church. He says, verse 22, when you do this, you are, have a look, you're despising the church of God and you're humiliating those that have nothing. The worst part really with this is, well, like, Think of outsiders, non-Christians, when they come in and look at the church. They're going to say, well, these, these guys talk about Jesus, but actually their life and community is it's exactly the same as I see in the world. It's exactly the same, where everyone just hangs out with people that they like. There's, no, there's, nothing, there's nothing powerful there. 
Verse 19 here, just in case you were wondering, has to be read sarcastically. But Paul says, no doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's favor. Uh, he's kind of saying, look, I know some of you think God loves you more because of your wealth and your status, but that isn't right. Because actually Jesus welcomes everyone. Look at verse 23 to 26. Now, just a heads up here, because we actually lose something in the English language. For any language nerds, or really, you'll, you'll, you might have noticed this, or perhaps you haven't. In English, we say the word you, whether it's singular or plural. That's quite unusual in other languages, and it's unusual in the Greek. The Greek had a way of emphasizing when it's a plural you. All of the yous here are plural. So will you allow me just to say you all as, I re as we read these verses, just so we pick up. These are plural yous. Verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you all. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you all. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you all drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you all eat this bread and drink this cup, you all proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Just think of that, that first communion table where Jesus sat down with his disciples the night before he died. People call this the Last Supper, which incidentally is... One of the worst cases of false advertising I've ever seen. The whole point is this, this wasn't the last supper Jesus was going to eat with his disciple. He was, he was coming back. Uh, the whole point here, um, in terms of what Jesus, when he gathers these disciples together, as you hear these you alls, think of the people that were sat around that table. Peter, the working class fisherman. Matthew, the excluded tax collector working for enemy Rome. Judas, who was the well-spoken southerner from Judea. Jesus invites this ragtag bunch of natural enemies to sit at this table together. That is important because it is to this ragtag bunch of misfits Jesus gives one of his most powerful illustrations let me just try and explain it. The communion table really is one of the most profound of Jesus' illustrations. There's lots of lenses and ways we could try and explain it. Let me try to capture it one way. Today, the communion cup uh, is one of the most beautiful symbols in the world and in the Christian faith, but it wasn't always that way. I don't know if you know this, but the cup used to be one of the most terrifying images in the whole Bible. Throughout the Old Testament, the cup keeps appearing as this symbol of God's coming judgment on the world. Because of our, because of our sin against God, we have become alienated from God. Do you ever feel that? Because of our sin against one another, we have become alienated from one another. Do you feel that? The Bible says all of, that, all of that sin is being shoved in this cup, and because God believes in justice, which is a good thing, one day all of us will be handed this cup of judgment for our sin, and that is terrifying. But on that night, Jesus turns to his friends. He says, I'm going to drink it for you. I'm going to drink it for you. At the cross, I'm going to take every last drop of God's judgment so that you get to go free. You see, this is the gospel. This is why Christians get so excited. If, you, if you're visiting today, you're wondering why, are Christ, why are these Christians smile and sing songs. Like, what's going on? Jesus drinks the cup of wrath so that we get to drink the cup of blessing. Jesus drinks all my sin. He drinks all my shame. 
all of my dirt, all of my hell, and we just get to drink wine at the Feast of Heaven. Isn't that good news? Jesus takes this image of terror and he turns it into an image of blessing. But it is so important. Who gets to actually sit at this table? Who gets an invite? Consider for a moment if Jesus had shown the same kind of social snobbery that the Corinthians were showing, the same kind of demographic division that we so often are guilty of, and he just invited people that were like him. Do you think you would have got an invite? Do you think Jesus would be kind of impressed with your status? Oh, that's someone I need to get to know. Would he be impressed with your wealth, your good deeds, your race, your style, your education? Which one of us could have walked up to the Son of God, the high King of heaven, and sat down at his table without invitation? None of us. You see, out there in the world, we like to play these games. Oh, this human is better than that human. This human is better than this human. This group, they're better than this group. But in here, God is the great equalizer. We don't come into church with our credentials and our class. We come into church as equals. When we walk in that door, we are all the same because we are all sinners who need Jesus. And brothers and sisters, you and I have been invited to sit at this table. Jesus has invited us to be forgiven, to be restored, to be healed, to be loved. Jesus welcomes everyone. And so do you see, do you see why Social snobbery is such a big deal at church because it just, it rubs against the gospel. Check out verse 27 to 32. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and ill, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. Now, these are, these are pretty tricky verses. Did you know it can be a sin to come to church and take communion? If you come to church just to, just to receive a blessing from God, but you shun God's people, I don't want to talk to them. The Bible says you're just, you're just drinking judgment on yourself. That's not you partaking in the Lord's Supper and so Paul says you need to examine your heart before you approach this table. Have I really grasped the beauty of this gospel of being restored to God, God creating a people, a family? Or actually, have I been despising and excluding and ignoring people for whom Christ died? Verse 30, I don't know about you, verse 30 is shocking, isn't it? Paul says, this is why some of you are sick and dying. Now look, this is a really profound teaching. We have to deal with this quickly, but let me say, we cannot always draw a straight line between sickness and sin. That, that is, isn't how it works. But Paul says, sometimes there is a line. When we are deeply spiritually sick, 
that can lead to physical sickness and even death. God adores every member of this church. Let me say that again. God adores every member of this church. And he won't be passive if you try to push them out. Because Jesus welcomes everyone. Verse 33. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you all gather to eat, you all should all eat together. Anyone who is hungry should eat something at home so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. And when I come, I'll give further instruction. This is God's word. Now, what does this mean for us? What does this mean for us today? Uh, Look, the reality is we don't meet in homes for communion anymore in quite the same way. Um, But the principle here is exactly the same. Because when we come to church, let's face it, it's still tempting to just hang out with people who are like us, isn't it? And when we do this, often unintentionally, we are excluding others. We're making them feel like Jesus and church isn't for people like them. Let me read this this quote from a guy called Don Carson. I don't know if the text is too small on the screen. You can just listen in if you want. A quote from Don Carson. Most people have their circle of in people, their list of compatible people, their friends. But Christian love must go beyond that to include people outside the group. The church isn't made up of natural friends, but natural enemies. And what binds us together isn't common education, common race, common income, common politics, common nationality, common accents, common jobs, or whatever. Christians come together not because they form a natural group, but because they have been saved by Jesus. Because of this common allegiance and the fact we've all been loved by Jesus, we commit to doing what he says, to love one another. We're a band of natural enemies who love one another for Jesus' sake. Now, people today, uh, they make a big deal about diversity. I don't know if you've seen that in your workplace, in the radio. Diversity is a big buzzword. It's so important. Diversity, diversity. Of course, diversity is important, but actually, it's only the first step. Because in the church, Jesus wants diversity and unity. He wants to see a diverse people united as one. The goal isn't mere diversity, it's unity. The kind of unity that creates a compelling community. Uh, It displays the gospel, it transforms life, and it shines hope into our divided world. That is God's plan for his local church. So here's a few concrete challenges for us. I don't know which one of these might strike home. Let me throw a few out. Think about where you sit on a Sunday. Is that including or is that excluding others? Is who you approach to talk to after church, is that including or is that excluding? What does your body language tell people when you're talking to them? Are you showing that you really care about them or are you sort of peeking over the shoulder at who else you could talk to? Is there someone that you just keep leaving out of socials and and text messages? Well, here's some some specific calls to action that we might, might be able to adopt. Why not drag people into conversations at the end, especially people who look like they're on their own? Go out of your way to catch and talk to newcomers. The Welcome Team do a wonderful job of that, and I know lots of you do as well. How good would it be if all of us had that radar on? I've not seen that person before. I'm going to go say hi. Ask how long they've been coming along and if you can introduce them to some people. By the way, that's a good way of phrasing it. How long have you been coming along? Rather than saying, are you new to find out they've been coming 20 years uh, and you've just not spotted them. Um, How long have you been coming along? How are you? Here's a big one. 
Why don't you actively seek out a surprising friendship in this church? That might mean grabbing someone that actually you've, you've, you've been, a, been a part of this church for a long time and you have to go up to them and say, look, we've been at this church for years and I don't think we've ever spoken. I'm sorry. How are you? How's it going? Actively seek out surprising friendships, people that are different to you. And here's the last one. Rejoice. Rejoice when your home group has people who are different from you in there. Because actually, that is displaying something wonderful about the gospel. Don't grumble there, rejoice. Find ways, but there's just a few ideas. Let me put the onus on you. Find ways to practice the radical inclusion of Jesus. And let me close with a story of encouragement. Um, up until yesterday, I was going to use a recent story from this church, but actually, I didn't want to embarrass the people who probably know I was talking about them. So, um, let me use a story from our last church. When we were there, uh, someone once opened up their home on Burns Night, and uh, they invited about 10 different people from church. And my wife, Sarah, brought her friend along who'd never been to church before in their life. Uh, and at this table, there was a, there was a few young Londoners. Uh, there was a foreign family with a new baby. There was a very elderly woman uh, from a council sheltered housing uh, down the road who someone went and picked up and brought along. Here's my favorite one. There was an ex-convict who had just recently come to Christ, sat next to a policewoman, <laughs> and another policeman, I think, as well. There was an East London creative sat next to a West London trader who'd come in his suit, and then there was an old Swedish widow who'd just moved to the country. And I can honestly say it was one of the best evenings of the year. It was so much fun, true story. Sarah's friend came up afterwards and said they had never seen anything like that in their life. They'd never seen anything like that in their life. What is it that took these different people, put them all together at the same table? Think about what that communicates. It communicates that something powerful has destroyed the divisions of society and the divisions of the human heart. Something has united people that is actually stronger than demographics and hobbies. Something has taken people and sat them around the same table as family. What is that thing? Church, let's get this community asking that question. Let's get it so they cannot stop wondering until that is such a nagging question that they have to come and find out. And when they ask, we can tell them it's Jesus. And that actually there might be tables out there, a lot of tables out there where they don't get an invite. But this is a table where everyone is welcome. Our world is really hungry for community. Our world is really hungry for unity. Let's show them where to find it. Jesus welcomes everyone. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much. That is true. Jesus welcomes everyone. And we know that is true because Jesus has welcomed us. Thank you that he came down and in invited and included us. We really are sorry for the ways that we have not done the same. We pray that you would help us to be like Jesus and show that radical inclusion to others. And we thank you for this precious communion table that reminds us that we were once enemies with you, but we are now friends. That we were once enemies with one another, but we're now family. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.